and we'll see what happens. All right, David, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we are now live. Uh, and it's okay. just a matter of waiting to see whether everyone uh, comes in. So, for those of you who have now joined our new stream, thank you for joining us. Uh, I believe we have resolved uh, this technical glitch. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes just for folks to join in. Uh, I'm going to send a new link to everyone who signed up. Uh, and manage my events. Oop. Let's see quickly send a email. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you're able to catch this one, uh, I think we've resolved our issues. I'm going to quickly send an email uh, to everyone who has signed up uh, just in case. Martin, you're frozen. Oh, I think it should be fine. Maybe it's just with you. Uh, I think I should be fine. Can you hear me now? I can, I can hear, hear you, you, but I'm, I'm frozen, frozen on, on your, your screen. screen. Okay. The good thing is, uh, it looks like it's broadcasting fine. Uh, so I can see you perfectly all right. Uh, uh, give me a second for the live stream. Here is so you can see me moving around? Oh, yeah, yeah. No problem. Uh, that should okay. all be fine. I'm, I'm, I'm frozen, frozen on your, on like, like the. the you're, You're totally, totally frozen, frozen and oh, I'm okay. totally frozen. Uh, give me a second. Can you see me here? Nope. Can you see me here? Nope. nope. Uh, well, uh, you have to take it on my uh, you have to take it on my word that we can see you just fine. Uh, okay. All right. So perhaps this is good. It's like uh, not having to stare at a mirror while. Uh, uh, you, you talk to the audience. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. It's, it's just going to be me talking. talking. <laughs> right, so. Yeah. If anything goes wrong, I'll let you know. Uh, but until that happens, okay. let's assume that everything's fine. Anywho, while everyone's uh, piling in, uh, David, thank you very much for joining us. I'm glad we could just push past that technical issue. Uh, but yeah, fantastic. Uh, where are you coming from yes. today? I said to the folks you were in Arkansas. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm in Little Rock, Rock Arkansas. Arkansas. The DD South. Nice, nice. Uh, and uh, mm. what's that lovely painting you have behind you? Are you, are you, uh, are yes. you into drafts? Um, I, I am. Mr. Giraffe, Giraffe I thought, would be lovely um, sort of overseer, overseer of, of the, the event. event. So, so you, you and the, the giraffe. giraffe. Is it, a, so, is it yeah. your writer's totem, the giraffe? Does it sort of represent something <laughs> in, in your, in your uh, style? Uh, I do. I do. It's, um, it was given to me, uh, a friend of mine painted it, so I hung it up above the bed. I just got mentioned that there is an echo, hopefully I've just fixed that. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I used this echo cancellation, hopefully that has undone itself. Uh, we're just going to give a minute or two just for folks to hopefully check back in uh, into this new stream. Sure. Uh, well, we'll, might as well use this time to see how many new subscribers we have. Oh, we are now 30 away from 100,000, so perhaps uh, us wow. dithering so long has uh, has really helped. So only 30 to go, so if you haven't signed up for uh, Reedsy's channel, please do. Uh, but we'll give this a start in just a few minutes. Uh, we had uh, quite a few more people in our last stream, so we just give them a second just to uh, settle in. Uh, but yeah, I really do appreciate everyone just uh, hanging in there. Oh, I've got it as well. I've got the ebook edition. Is that the same cover? This is the UK edition. No, this is the American edition. You have the British edition. I love the British edition, actually. But the American version isn't so terrible. Yeah. With the little rubber, see the little rubber ducky? Uh, yeah. Right, right there. Yeah. Where's that? Cute. For us, we're unfamiliar with swimming pools, so that's probably where they had to change that. Anyway. Uh, right. Right. David, everyone's been super patient, uh, so I'm going to let you go. Everyone at home, there's going to be a QA and a at the end. If we didn't catch everything, there will also be uh, a transcript and replay available later, so don't worry about taking notes. David, if you need anything, let me know, but fingers crossed. Uh, okay. It's fine. Thanks, Martin. And really, thank you, Martin. And 
to Reedsy for having me today. I'm really excited about it. And I'm really excited to share how I wrote this book in three months and landed an agent and got a really big deal out of it. Um, so the first thing I want to do with y'all as you're piling in and you don't have to participate in this, but you might want to, um, you can also look at it later. Martin said you could, you'll be able to view this whole thing later. So, um, anyway, I'm the author of this book among two other books. This is called tell me how this ends well. And, um, I'd love if you read it and let me know what you think by sending me an email, which is on my website, um, dslevinson.com. Um, I, lo I love getting feedback from readers and you could tell me whether you think, you know, how the, the 90 days paid off or not. Um, so before we really begin, I want you guys to do something for me. If you have a pen and paper handy, uh, a scrap paper, doesn't have to be anything, but go and get it. I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to fetch a piece of scrap paper and a pen or pencil. We'll play the Jeopardy tune. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so I will assume that you have gotten a scrap paper and a pen. And now what I want you to do is close your eyes. Everyone collectively close your eyes. And I want you to bring up your book whether you've started it, finished it, or in the middle of it, your novel, okay? Do you have it? Can you sort of rummage through it and see it from beginning, middle, and end? So locate your main character at the beginning, and I want you to imagine him or her in an inciting incident. I want you to find the beginning of your book. Imagine it. Now go to the middle of the book, locate your main character, find an image with your main character that you think might be the midpoint of your book. Then I want you to go to the end. And this, is, this might be the most important image. I want you to locate your main character at the end of your book and fashion an image. Imagine your character at the end of your novel. What, what is this image that this character is in? So then I want you to open your eyes and I want you to jot down these images very quickly. They can be one sentence, two sentences. So you want to write down the beginning image, the middle image, and the ending image. And when I wrote, tell me how this ends well, that's what I did. I located a beginning image or an inciting incident, as a lot of people like to call it, although I don't really have an inciting incident, not really, but we can talk about that later. Um, so I did that, then I located a, a midpoint image, and then I located an ending image, and I wrote from the beginning image to the middle image. Then I wrote from the middle image to the ending image. And I did that over the course of 90 days. You chart, it's a good way to chart your progress. And you don't have to think about writing a 500 page book. You have to think about writing one page every day that gets me closer to the middle and then closer to the end. It's a really, really, really great technique if you can do it. So why did I want to write a book in 90 days? Like, why would, I, why would I set that challenge for myself? I was living in Atlanta. I was very unhappy, <laughs> very depressed. I was teaching at Emory University, uh, a couple of classes, and it was my second semester. I, I, I had won a fellowship, a fiction fellowship to teach at Emory, and it was a two-year fellowship, and I was, 
I was in the last semester there. And one day I woke up and I said, this is what I want. I want to leave Atlanta in better shape than when I got here. And I want to have a manuscript under my belt. And that's what I did. So I, that's what I did. I got up every morning, I wrote, I taught, and I went on a bike ride. I wrote every morning as long as I could until I had to go teach, came back, wrote more, and then went on a bike ride. And I was writing about 2,500 words a day, which is a lot. I think that's 10 pages maybe, but I had a goal. I had a I knew what I wanted and I was not going to leave Atlanta without fulfilling these promises to myself. These are promises to yourself that you make. So you can do this in tandem. Maybe you want to repaint your house by yourself. Maybe you want to write a book in 90 days. They sort of feed each challenge feeds the other. My wish to get into better shape fed my desire to finish my novel. It was all sort of a uh, kind of a DIY, you know, self improvement challenge. Um, so I have seven tips for you, for you to write a novel in ninety days, no matter what kind of novel it is, no matter how long or how short. So first things first. You have to decide if you want to write a novel. These are very, very time consuming projects. Um, when I was writing, tell me how this ends. Well, I was teaching two classes. I was sitting on committees. I had a very full plate, but I managed to carve out time every single day to write, to go to the gym and to go on a bike ride. I didn't go to the gym as often. I went on more bike rides actually. I did a lot of cardio and I stopped and I changed my diet. I stopped eating ice cream late at night. Um, I'm an emotional eater, as you can tell, because I put all the weight back on. I'm going to have to put myself on that challenge again. Um, so first you have to really decide whether or not you want to write a novel. So once you've decided that, yes, I want to write a novel, then you have to ask yourself, what kind of book do I want to write? What kind of genre? Is it a satire? Is it a murder mystery? Is it both? As is the case with, I'm sorry, I keep bringing this book up like it's like speaking for me. Um, but Tell Me How the Sense Well is um, a dark comedy about um, three siblings who plot the death of their father over Passover. Um, it sounds maudlin. Uh, a little bit morbid, but it's actually quite funny. Um, so once you come up with a premise, you have to commit to the premise. And I committed to the premise that I was going to write a satirical novel about anti-Semitism in the year 2022, which is the background and backdrop of my novel. The rise of anti-Semitism in, in America, which is a little bit timely still. And then the foreground is this family that's coming apart at the seams. So once you determine the genre and the tone, then you need to determine a frame, a time frame, and a structure. This is all before you even sit down to write. You're, you're prepping, this is, this is preparatory work. So you're prepping your, your brain to jumpstart this project. So you're getting your brain revved up. So a lot of people, let me just pause here to say, you might think that I'm telling you to outline and I'm not, I never outlined this book. I don't, I don't use outlines. Um, there are two kinds of writers, outliners and pantsers, and I happen to be a pantser, which is like seat of your pants kind of writing. I'm not saying don't outline. 
I mean, I'm kind of a hybrid, quite frankly, because I'll tell you more about this later. Um, but it's very, very important that you nail down the time frame and the structure. So what was my time frame within the novel? What is my time frame? It takes place over four days, Friday to Monday. It takes place over Passover weekend in LA. And so once I nailed down the time frame, I needed to nail down the structure. And there are all kinds of structures. Every book has its own structure. And I decided that I would do a Rashomon structure, which is one character telling the story, different characters telling the same, the same story from different points of view. So my book has multiple points of view. It has four main characters. And I decided that I was going to write it from the three siblings and then the mom's point of view. So why did I choose the three siblings and then the mother? Because the book is about the father. He never got his own voice. I decided that he would not get his own voice because you learn so much about him from the siblings and from the mom. And I decided that I would, you have to be very, very, very specific when you're determining your structure. So I started with the youngest son. I went to the, the middle sister. I went, then I went to the eldest son and then I went to the mother. So it was, it was chronological. And what I did was I decided that I would write novellas instead of these very short chapters that is so trendy today. So every chapter or every section, every sibling gets 120 pages. I had to write, so on Friday is Jacob and he gets 120 pages and I wrote his entire day. And then with Edith, it was Saturday and she got her entire day. And then Sunday with Moses, the third sibling, and he got his entire day. And then the mother, Roz, Monday got her entire day. Um, so I was very, very, very committed to the premise, the time frame, and the structure. So once you've committed to all of these things, you're not even ready to write yet. And you're asking me, well, where, where, where am I, where am I keeping all of this? Am I keeping this all in my head? No, you're writing it down in a notebook that will become your Bible. You're writing a not this, this notebook is, I don't have the notebook, but consider it your novel's Bible. It's a pathway for you when you get stuck, when you need to work something out, when you're, when you're doing the prep work. You're the chef of your own novel, so you have to do the prep work, right? So I suggest buying a really thick notebook and a really great pen or pencil, and you're writing all of this down. You're writing it all down. So the third thing you want to do before you ever sit down to write is you want to write up 10-page bios for your main characters. In my case, I had four. But I also did a fifth one for the father who never even appears because I had to know him inside it out too. So 10 page bios, single spaced 10 page bios of every main character. You know, you, you, you really in a novel should not have more than three or four main characters, um, depending on the book, I suppose. But so you're going to have, you're gonna have a few bios to write. And you have to do that also with the supporting characters, but you only need to write five pages. So you have 10 supporting characters, you have to know them too, but you don't have to know them as in depth as you do with your main characters. So that's the third thing. Plus, okay, now, now it gets a little tricky. So you have to pay attention and listen to me very carefully. Your main characters have to have moral arguments that exist in contention to all the other characters. 
This is very tricky. So in my book, for example, I have three siblings who want to plot the death of their father, but that's not really true. It's actually one sibling who wants it, and he has to talk the other siblings into it. So Jacob, the first character, is the one who really wants to kill the father. And they want to kill him to save their mother. It's not just that they want them, they don't want money. The mother has had a very hard marriage, and the father is as a domestic abuser, and he's been very mean to all of them. And they want to get rid of him because the mother is dying. And they want to give her the last few months of her life. They want to give her happiness and joy and peace because the father is, as they come to find out, the father, the father has caused her demise. So Jacob, who is closest to his mom, wants to destroy the father. Edith, who's closer to her dad, doesn't want to. And Moses is on the fence. Moses can go either way. So when I say moral argument, this is what I mean. Jacob has a moral argument, which is what? He wants the father dead. Edith's moral argument is she doesn't want the father dead. And Moses' argument is, I'm not sure. I'm ambivalent. Talk me into it or talk me out of it. So do you see how these three characters come into conflict constantly just because of their own moral arguments? And this all makes up the moral universe of your novel. I know this is very, very complicated stuff, but I, I think you'll get it once you write it down. A lot of writers make the mistake of writing characters that are exactly like every other character. And I learned, I guess from grad school and just from reading a ton, that the best books really have you know, people call it different things, but I call it moral, ar moral arguments. So every character, every main character has a different moral argument. Then you have supporting characters who sort of show up for Jacob. They show up for Edith and they show up for Moses. So you have all of these characters sort of like working through the moral arc of your moral universe, which is your novel. I hope I hope this is making sense and you're not like rolling your eyes like what the hell is he talking about? But think of moral arguments as stances, points of view, which is different from points of view. Um Jacob has a very specific point of view in the novel, which is I want to kill my dad to save my mom. Edith has a very specific moral argument or point of view, which is I love my dad and I don't want anything to happen to him. I hate my mother. And Moses, again, is ambivalent and is like, I love my mother and I love my father. I'm really not too sure what to do. Okay, so this is all in preparation for writing your novel in 90 days. A lot of people don't put this prep work in before they sit down to write. And this is why books take 10, 12 years or five, three years or four years. So once you get in and you start writing you have the first image the beginning image you're writing to the middle image and you're writing to the ending image so you're writing you're in you're good you're in the zone and you get done with a section or a chapter and you're like hooray and you go away and you come back the next day and you have no idea what to write you sit there in front of your computer or your, you know, your long hand and you're stumped. You don't know what to do. Here's an amazing tip that I learned. No one told me this. I just sort of like learned this on my own. So what you want to do, you're writing to the end of a chapter, let's say. So you finish chapter three. Um, before you ever get up from your seat, no matter if you have to go to the bathroom, the house is on fire, you have to save your child, you have to save your snake, like whatever, you need to sketch out, type it in. So and so you come to chapter end of chapter three, chapter four, you're typing, chapter four. You put a bracket up, then you type in 
three or four sentences the beginning of chapter four. So, you know, I mean, what can I tell you? Let me, let me, let me go through this. Um, I can tell you. So let's say, you know, okay, so I come to the middle of page 51 and Jake, it's Jacob's section. And I type, the business of death waits for no man. And with that, he clicked off. And that's it for me for that day. I wrote 2,500 words. I don't want to write more. I'm tired. I want to, you know, I want to go on a bike ride or whatever. So what do I do? I put a bracket up and I say, what will happen in the next scene? Not in the next chapter, in the next scene, because that's what you're doing. You're writing scenes, which are composed of images, right? So what you want to do is put a bracket up and you want to type out the image with your main character. Uh, your main character's name is Patricia. And Patricia wants to buy a dog. And at the end of chapter three, Patricia decides she wants to buy a dog. Chapter four, Patricia, maybe Patricia gets in her car and is driving to the pet store when it starts to rain and she skids off the road. Because you always want to complicate your narrative, right? You don't want to give your characters everything they want all the time, or else why is a reader going to be reading the story? They want struggle, they want conflict, they you know they want all this stuff. They want to, they want all this dramatized. So this this might be the most important key to getting your novel done in ninety days. Never get up from your desk or your bed or wherever the bathtub, wherever you are without giving yourself a breadcrumb to the next scene. This is very vital, vital that you get this right. The scene doesn't have to be perfect. The image doesn't even have to be perfect, but you've got to move the narrative forward at all times, which now we come to the fifth point, which is, um, what is my fifth point? Um, okay, so equally important, and sort of going back to the beginning a bit, you need to figure out your beginning, your middle, and end, right? Uh, you don't want to figure this out during your writing. You need to be writing toward something. You always want to be writing toward an image. So this will set the word count for you. If you want to write a 300-page book, then you need to figure out what the beginning, middle, and end is. And then you need to set a timer or counter of how many words you need to write every day to get to a 300 page novel. My novel was 450 pages. It was like 150,000 words. Um, so I had to write 2,500 words a day, more or less. And I never took a day off. Don't take days off. It's very hard. Continuity is key, is another key element to this. Um, that's why I kept writing and I kept going because I knew the continuity. I would lose the continuity of the novel and then I would have to go back and I didn't want to have to do that. So six, like, like a shark, always move forward, never back. Your job is to complete a book in 90 days, so complete it. You have plenty of time to revise later. Um, like I said, like, um, if you have an issue on page 40 with continuity, make a little notation in your notebook and go back when you're done with the manuscript completely and fix it. You might have to fix other things. If you tamper with something on page 30, it might upset something on page 120. You have to keep a notebook of these things. So you can have a heading, continuity, and these are the problems that you're like, you think about as you're writing. And so you can go back and correct them. Seventh, also incredibly important. Do not stop writing until you've come to the end of your word count for the day. Uh, this word count does not include what I like to call your roadmap scenes. Those are the bracketed images, scenes. That That's not part of your word count. So that's also very important. Um, and 
eighth, uh, Maslatov, you've you've written from the beginning image to the middle image to the ending image. You have a completed first draft in ninety days. Way to go! It's a hell of a, a hell of a thing. Let me tell you. Um, so now, what do you do? What do you do? You feel like you've just run seven marathons at once. You're exhausted, and you never want to look at this book again. Quite frankly. Um, yeah. So what do you do? Um, what I did with Tell Me How the Send Will is I put it in a drawer for a month. I didn't look at it. I tried not to think about it, but of course that's easier said than done. And after that month, well, before, once you finish, you get to leave Atlanta. You're also 30 pounds lighter, by the way, which was exciting. Um, so I left Atlanta exactly, you know, I, 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 I had promised myself I would leave lighter and with a manuscript. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I didn't look at the book probably for a month or six weeks. I moved, I think I moved out of Atlanta and I went to New York and I got out the manuscript. I gave it a, a solid read. I fixed what needed to be fixed. Um, I sent it out to about 30 agents, most of whom had different things to say about it. No one had the same thing to say. So I knew like, I knew that I had a good manuscript. If none of the agents, some of them just didn't like it, I guess, whatever. But I found one wonderful agent. It only takes one. Um, he took me on in November, in mid-November. He wanted me to do some rewriting and I told him no. Um, I thought the manuscript was perfectly fine the way it was. And he kind of ultimately agreed. And, you know, we had this discussion. I was, I remember, I'll never forget this. I was in Athens, New York, in uh, Nick Flynn's house. He's uh, a poet and memoirist. His wife is, what's her name? That actress, I can't think of her name. I'll think of it later. Um, but I was in his house and I felt like I was working on a new book already. and. And my agent um, called me and he's like, I'm not sure I want to send it out right now because it was toward the holidays. It was in December. Like it was um, like December 11th. Um, no, it was, was it? Anyway, it was, it was mid, mid December. And he was like, oh, you know, holidays, no one reads during the holidays. And, and I said, just send it out. And if no one wants it, then we'll send it out again in January or February. And he said, okay. And that was on a Friday. That was on like a Wednesday, I guess. And he sent it out for people to read over the weekend. And by Tuesday, we had an offer. Um, I got on the phone with the publisher, Crown, and the editor who was going to edit the book on Wednesday. The deal was closed Wednesday. It literally took two days for this book to sell. And that is a really rare sort of story I've come to find out. Um, I can't really tell you why it sold so quickly, except I guess I had a good agent. And I think the manuscript was really tight. And it was really tight because looking back, I followed my own advice, which I almost never do. But in this case, I did for whatever reason. Yay for me. Um, so I kind of, the tips that I'm giving you are the tips that I didn't even know I was following, quite frankly, until I looked back. And a friend of mine was like, how did you write this book in 90 days? And I, and I was like, I'm not sure. And then I started thinking about how I did it. And this is how I did it. And you can do it too. Um, if it can happen to me, and I've been living off my advance for the last few years. I mean, it can happen to you. Have I written another book in 90 days? No, not yet. Um, I wrote another book in five months. Um, but yeah, so 
just to recap, do I have time, Martin? Martin, are you there? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You can uh, recap for sure. Okay. Um, okay. So just to recap, you want to start out with three different images: beginning, middle, and end. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be images. They have to be what I would call a scene, quite frankly. So your inciting incident is, you know, your character gets into a car. Like, let's take Caroline Levitt's book. I think she wrote a book where there's a character who gets in a car and there's a bee in the car and she has a car wreck. And that's the inciting incident. For me, I mean, you would never know that I have an inciting incident from the first. So I, I labeled all of my chapters like this. I don't know if you can see this, but it says Jacob Jacobson or the White Peacock. So... And then it has the date of when the chapter takes place or the section. And the first sentence is Los Angeles welcomed them with a dark, moody sky that broke open halfway through breakfast. And that's kind of what the whole novel is about. It's about LA. It's about breaking open. It's about lack of rain. Um, it's not really about breakfast, although I don't know. Um, so, but the inciting incident, and in, you know, when I when I was thinking of writing this novel, I thought, well, what kind of inciting incident would there be? The book is a a lot about driving in L.A. I love L.A. By the way, I'm not I'm not an L.A. hater, and my brother lived out there. I have cousins who live out there. I have good good friends who live out there, and I thought it was the perfect place to set a book about driving and how American culture is sort of lived within the car and on the highways. So I put these two characters, my Jacob is gay and he has his boyfriend who's German is with him and they're driving along and they skid, Jacob's driving and he's talking and he gets distracted and he bumps very hard into the back of a Mercedes on the highway, which is backed up. And his German partner, who isn't wearing a seatbelt, hits his head. And that's the inciting incident. It's a very small inciting incident, but it sort of kicks off the whole book. And it happens within the first 30 pages, I guess. So that was the image I was writing to. I was like, what can I do? Like, how can I complicate the narrative sort of immediately? And that's... It, it 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 throws a wrench into Jacob's plans to get to a certain place on time. So immediately I was complicating the narrative, right? And you all, this is what you always want to do. If your character wants to get from A to B, you have to put as many obstacles up in the character's path. So you have your three images. Then you have your 10 page bios that you're writing out in your notebook so you can refer to them. Did the character have blue eyes? Or did I, I wrote blue eyes here, then I wrote green eyes, blonde hair, black hair, like you have to nail these characters down. It's very important to nail them down. This is all before you're writing, right? You haven't written a single word yet. So then you wanna figure out, well, no, I just, I just jumped ahead. You have to decide what kind of book you wanna write first, right? And you need to figure out the structure, and the time frame. Time frame for writing, it doesn't matter if you're writing a book that takes place over 10 years or over four days like I did. You can still do this in 90 days. Um, fiction is all about the compression of time, right? So a book that you, a real life event that might take place over six months, you wanna compress into six days. Six Days of the Condor, for example, is a novel. And what do the what do the film industry do? They cut it down even further. Three days of the Condor. So fiction is all about the compression of time, right? So you have your you have the kind of book you're writing. You have the three images. You have now you go on to your ten page bios and your five page bios. Um, then you start writing 
bring, bring, bring. You type your first sentence, whatever that sentence is, and you're writing along, you're writing along, you're writing along. It's like, you know, five in the afternoon, your kids are coming home. You have to put the writing aside after you've written however many words that you need to write that day to get to the end of a novel in 90 days. Before you get up from the chair, and I'm sorry that I, I keep harping on this, but this is very important. Make sure that you have the next scene image going. Three lines, two lines, doesn't matter. And then you leave, you leave that guidepost up at the top of the page so you know what you're writing. Don't erase it. You only get to erase it once you're done with that scene. Once you're done with Patricia needs, Patricia got in her car and went to the pet store, but you know, but the roads were icy and she skidded and hit a telephone pole. Once you've written that, then you get to erase the bracketed, those words. And it actually feels really good. It does. I don't know why there's something like psychological about it, but it does feel really good because you've completed a task. If you think about writing, don't think about writing a novel, think about writing individual pages that get you to the end of your final image. They're tiny little bricks, little image bricks, and they have to fit in certain ways. But what you're doing before you even sit down to write is you're doing three fourths of the work already. So once you sit down, you can l feel free to you know let the writing go you know instead of like having to stop and figure out like oh is he 40 years old or 50 years old you know is is he norwegian or is he american like you will have taken care of all of this long before you've you've sat down to write your first word um equally important again is knowing the beginning, middle, and end. I know that's really, really, it's a daunting task, but you've really got to push through and figure out what the beginning, middle, and end of your book will be roughly. It does not have to be exact. I mean, the ending that I ended up using was not the ending that my editor liked. She was like, no, this is impossible. I'm not having... This is not this is not the ending to your novel. So I had to rewrite it, which was annoying. But and I'm not sure she was right or not about the whole ending thing. I still liked my ending. It was much darker. But um yeah, because once you get an editor, they'll want to change things. Um they changed my title. Um and I had to write a fifth section. My original the original book was four sections. And then my editor basically strong armed me into writing a fifth section, um, sort of a coda, which is fine, whatever. You do what they say once they buy your book. Um, you always want to be moving forward, constantly moving forward, forever forward. If you think you've made a mistake the, the day before, don't worry about it. You don't allow yourself to go back and rewrite something. This is how people get trapped in writing novels for 10 years. And some of those novels are great. Some of those novels are fantastic and it might take 10 years to write it. Um, but I wrote, at least from my own standpoint, a very intricate, very moving, fun, entertaining novel about this kooky Jewish family in LA in 2022, which is past. No, it's this year. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, and I did it in three months. Um, I didn't think about like, I didn't let myself worry about um, marketing or audiences or or anything. I didn't let my inner editor get in the way. And this is also another really good piece of advice. No matter what you're working on, 
no matter if it's three months or three years or 30 years, you need to be able to give yourself permission to write whatever you want. I know you've heard this probably a million times, but I finally, I got out of my own way. Um, I let, I let my imagination go crazy with this novel. Tell me how this sounds well. And it was freeing and it was amazing to write. Um, I learned more about writing and my own writing in 90 days, I think, than I ever learned in grad school. No offense to the new school or to any of my wonderful instructors, but writing is sort of, you know, it's very solitary. It's, it's very heady. Um, you know, you might even say it's a little bit self-indulgent, but there's something, and I know you're going to know what I'm talking about, but there's something so divine about sitting down and creating something out of nothing. And that's what you're doing when you're sitting down to write is you are creating something new that no one's ever seen before. And I hope that you know, you'll take these tips from me and go forth and, you know, write your little heart out. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Well, uh, well we started a little bit late, so uh, we're about to hit the Q&A, but that's amazing. Uh, I try to recap some of your points uh, in the comments there, but don't worry if you didn't catch them. There will be a transcript, everyone at home, uh, later on, uh, where you can, we'll sort of abridge all this, so it'll be, uh, yeah, all these tips ready for you to see. Uh, but that was amazing. Uh, anyone, uh, we're going to stick on for a bit for some questions, but do, uh, yeah, do let me know. Uh, I've got a question here already. Can you see the screen now, David? Um, I, should I open the chat window? Uh, well, I can, I can read them out for you instead. Uh, no. I can't, no, I can't see anything, sorry. Well, uh, Abion, one of our regulars, uh, she asks, how much time should I set aside for pre-planning and brainstorming? I'm assuming these 90 days are dedicated to writing only. I guess the better question is how long, how much, how long was your prep? Oh, that's a great question. Um, my prep was probably a month. I started, I started probably a month before. So I wrote this book from February to May, February, March, April, May. That's four months, so March, April, May. I started in March. So I did my prep in February. I didn't know I was doing prep. I didn't know any of this before. You know, this is all, I compiled all of this later. But I started thinking about the novel in February and I was writing down the bios and all this kind of stuff. And I was doing the images. Um, and then in March, I started it. So I started like maybe March 10th and I finished May, early-ish May, mid-May. Yeah. Cause, but I give myself a month for sure. I think, yeah, the, the a lot of the chat going around the comments are, I think for folks who do write in certain genres or so, sort of books that do require a lot more planning, I guess the trap you could fall into is the sort of never-ending research. I've sort of written things where I go like, I just need to research this thing, see where this might be in this certain city. And before I know it, I've spent three hours just Googling stuff. I suppose that, that oh, yeah, no. you just need to lay the you foundation. You have to turn know. off your Wi-Fi. You've <laughs> got to, yeah, you, you've got to turn off your Wi-Fi. If you have a room without windows, like lock yourself in. You can't be distracted. If, But I understand, yeah, the research thing, I mean, I have a friend who does a ton of research and then starts writing and doesn't look at the research again. Like your subconscious absorbs a lot of the research that you do. And I think if you trust yourself more that it's like stored away in there and that it will come out subconsciously or unconsciously in your work. Um, yeah, historic. Like you're, I guess you're talking about like historical novels and that kind of stuff. Mm. I still think you could do it in third in ninety days. I think people will give themselves any opportunity not to do this in ninety days. So, I'm here to tell you that I had a very busy schedule, 
it was not a book that I had to research because it was all sort of inside of me, but you could do it in 90 days. You're, you're, you're stopping yourself. If you, you know, if you're saying like, oh, I need to keep researching or like, give yourself a deadline, give yourself a complete deadline of, I will research this topic for a week. I will choose my three images for a week. I will write these bios for a week. You know, you can break it up into weeks if that, if that helps. Um, we have a question here from Elizabeth, Lizzie. Uh, do you have any bad writing days, days when you didn't feel like writing? I, so I'll rephrase this a bit because you talked about not stopping until you hit your word count for the day. Um, like, I guess with all this other stuff going on with your teaching and, uh, you know, your actual work, like, can you talk, talk about the sort of situation you found yourself in when you weren't hitting your goal, but you just had to plow through? Yeah, there were a lot of days like that, actually. Um, and you know what? I think I did my best writing on those days. The days where I felt like it was a real struggle are the days that I, yeah, that I feel like I wrote the... The best scene, um, the best writing was probably on those days. Um, you know, I'm not you and you're clearly not me. So I don't know how you handle the stress of writing. But for me, if you find yourself writing to an image and you, you I have a client right now actually who sort of wrote himself to a corner. And it didn't, when I'm reading it, it doesn't seem like he wrote himself into a corner. And I, I haven't really talked to him about it, but he, he got in touch with me because he was like, I wrote myself into a corner, help. And this is why the notebook is so important. If I didn't know what the next scene was that I needed to write during the day, and I, I let's say I had a thousand words under my belt and I had to write 1,500 more, I would open the notebook to a clean page and I would I would sketch out what the character wanted, why the character was in the position he was in, what would he do to get out of it, how can I complicate the narrative, how could I add tension and conflict to the scene. Like I don't really I don't necessarily believe that writers get stuck or write themselves into a corner. I just think they're afraid that there's something about the scene that freaks them out and they back, they back off from it instead of plowing through it. And that's what I would do. I would plow through. If there was a scene I didn't understand why I'd written and I didn't know how to get the character from point B to point C, I would open the notebook, like I said, and I would sketch out. Or I would do another short little bio of this character at a different age. Like the age he might have been when he was 25. If I'm in a backstory, let's say I'm in a backstory the, and the character is 50 years old. And let's say he's 10 years old in the backstory. Um, then I would just, I would just switch his age up and I would write what he was like when he was five years older and five years younger. And it generally was sort of like, it unblocks whatever is blocked and it sort of, can open the floodgates and then you can write the scene or you scream into the void as I have done many times. Uh, that sort of leads us into our next question from Antoine. He asks, uh, and people have been asking this in the comments as well, how much detail goes into your 10 page bios? Can you give us like a, like a sort of picture of how you put those together? Sure. Um, yeah, you just, you start with basic questions the name, the full name, um, beginning, middle, and surname, if the character has. Has the character been married before? Has the character, other names that this character might have? Aliases. Where was he born? When was he born? Why was he born? Who are his parents? Who are his grandparents? Who are his great-grandparents? What are, color are his eyes? What does he look like? 
Does he like himself? Uh, is he gay, straight, or otherwise? Uh, how does he feel about the world? Is he a nihilist? Is he a cynic? Is he an optimist? Like, these are the kinds of questions. And all these questions will lead you to an image of this character. And then the character's bio. Then you won't be, I mean, how can I say this? The bio will lead you rather than you leading the bio. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, you're going to find yourself, once you've written enough about this character, that the character will take over the writing for you. I know that sounds super hokey, but that's what happened with Jacob, Edith, and Moses, and Roz, my four, my, and Julian, my five characters. I mean, I knew enough about them to begin with. Um, they're not really based on anybody, but they're sort of an amalgam of different people. And so the easiest way to write characters is to base them on someone you know or hate. Usually hating someone is a lot easier to write a character. Just make sure that you change all known characteristics if you're going to base a character on someone you don't like. So if the person is blonde hair, blue eyed, they need to be like red haired and brown eyed or whatever. They cannot be recognizable. <laughs> Just forewarned is forearmed. Um, does that help? Is that, yeah, does that... that's great. I also okay. in the uh, comments have shared a link to uh, a PDF that we've created. A read is a character bio template that asks you like so many questions, has bits oh, that you fill in all these things with. Anything from small details to little backstory bits. Yeah, but it's got to be super intricate. Mm. It's it's not it's not just like you're writing a story. You're writing this character's story. I guess bio is sort of misleading. When I say bio, I mean you're writing this character's origin story. Let's put it that way. It's an origin story. So by the time you're writing, you know this character as well as you know yourself. Because the character is you. Let's not kid ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, do you find that? Yeah, most protagonists are in, you know, some aspects of the writer, I guess. Yes. Uh, most. Okay, I've got some questions here. Sorry, I'm just having to dig back uh, into this. Uh, let's see. Here's one from Vanessa Williams. So that one or another one? Uh, how much rewriting or editing did you do after your first draft? Um. I tend to write pretty good first drafts. So I didn't have to do a lot of editing. I know <laughs> it's hard, to, oh. really talk, it's hard that... to really talk about this because <laughs> this book just kind of came out of me. The writing, the 90 days was the most laborious part of this book. It wasn't the writing. It was sort of the frenzied pace of writing a book in 90 days was the hardest part. Um, that's what I mean when I say, like, if you know your book before you sit down to write, which is basically what I did, then the frenzy pace might be the hardest thing for you. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, the draft, I remember looking at it after I set it aside for a month. I didn't let anyone read it. This is something else. I would be very, very careful about whom I let read my work. And this time around, I didn't show it to anyone except one person. She's a poet. She was a friend of mine, but not a great friend. And she was like, dude, you have a hit on your hands. And I was like, really? She's like, yes. But there are a couple scenes that you may really want to get rid of. And one of those scenes happens to be one of my favorite scenes in the entire novel. And I was like, no way, I'm not getting rid of that scene. And she was like, it reads farcically. And I was like, really? Ugh. It was a great scene. They dismember the father and like do all these things to him. And I loved it. It was fantastic. And she just thought it was overkill. Ha ha, no pun intended. And um, I got rid of it. And it really made a difference. So be very careful about who, like you can send your work to me, clearly, if you're easy, and I would be happy to tell you the truth about it. 
Um, plug for Reedsy. Just one little plug for Reedsy. Oh, this is um, this is all a plug for Reedsy. But uh, hey, always grateful. This for is that. all a plug for Reedsy. Um, yeah. So the, 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 yeah. So my first draft. I mean, I've written some really horrible first drafts. Like I'm not gonna. I won't get around. I have. I wrote three novels that never really saw the light of day before I published my first book. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. It's hard to say about first drafts. Yeah. I Um, think, yeah, the thing that people don't really quite get sometimes is they put a lot of like faith and all their eggs into their first book. And yeah, like the, the chances that that this is the greatest book you're ever going to write, or this is the best that you can do is probably, you know, fairly slim. It's like a numbers game, like a, with writing, it's just about getting, getting, getting the books out, getting the words out. Sometimes you just kind of want to shoot out that first one just so you can get to the second one and take with you everything you've learned. Richard Russo, who's a very famous American author, um, who wrote Empire Falls, um, he wrote five novels that he had to shelve before he wrote the sixth that finally hit. I mean, talk about perseverance. So we all have books that no one will ever see. And, you know, you, and you've never heard of me. But just think about the writers you have heard of who have their little drafts, skeletal drafts in their drawers, right? So. Okay. Oh, I've got a question here. I'll just do one more question. Should you always have a villain in your story? Yes. That's such a great question because I was thinking about that before we started this. That's a uh, yes, you should. You know, Julian Jacobson, the father, is, was my villain. And the thing that beginning writers and intermediate and even some seasoned writers seem to make um, is they make, and I see this a lot actually um, in my editing, that writers tend to make villains binary or to make their main characters binary so the villain is all or nothing you know the main character is like you know an angelic and the the villain is is a devil and that's it it, it's about moral argument right um a villain doesn't know he's a villain a villain has his own moral argument and lives in his own moral universe and the good guy lives in his own moral, has his own moral argument and lives in, lives. and the reason that they clash is because their moral arguments clash. So to write a villain who, you basically can't write a villain who knows that he's a villain because he doesn't know he's a villain. I mean, sometimes they do, sometimes they know they're bad guys, but no one really believes at the end of the day that they're evil. I don't think Hitler thought that he was evil and yet he's a villain and a monster. So the best advice I can give, yes, you always have, I mean, I would assume that yes, every story has a villain and every story has a hero, right? Um, We love to read the stories. It goes back to uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer, um, the Greeks, thank you, the Greeks. (laughs) Um, But yeah, uh, just, Make sure if you're if you when you do the ten page bio of a villain, I wouldn't even call him a villain. I would just call him another character who does bad things because that's that's basically what a villain is. Yeah. Like a villain is someone who does like what seventy percent bad to thirty percent good, and a good guy is like seventy percent good to thirty percent bad. Um, these binary characters are really what kill the creativity within a novel. No character is ever really good and no character is ever really bad. And you'll find that once you stop thinking about them in binary terms, in terms of moral arguments, then your writing, I think, will open up and you won't sort of paint yourself into a corner 
you know, where it's like a villain and against good guy, you know, it's like you've created a moral universe mm. and you've populated it with different moral arguments. Yeah. Like I think a lot of folks do have this idea. It's like, oh, there isn't a bad guy because, you know, the villain here is like society or institutional racism. Right. But for any of that, I guess there always has to be a character that personifies that. Otherwise, you're... Otherwise, your hero is just uh, what, fighting against the ether, in a way. Right, right. Okay, um, well, I'm noticing the time right now. Uh, everyone, uh, David is one of the editors we have here at Readsy. Uh, he and hundreds of other qualified editors who have worked on loads of books, many of which you may have even read, uh, are available to work with you. So if you think uh, your book is ready for a bit of professional help, uh, do head over to readz.com and you can work with David. You can find uh, his link to his profile uh, just well in the description of the previous video before this one, before that one got shut down. But I'll send it to you um, with the transcript in a few days. Uh, David, what sort of books uh, are you looking for? What sort of projects are you looking to work on right now as an editor? Um, anything. Um, I. I like mysteries, but I, I feel like I've, I'm sort of overloaded. I feel like that's that seems to be the genre du jour. So I guess right now I'm looking for more literary stories, whatever that means. Um, maybe not a murder <laughs> <laughs> um, or some kind of hellacious crime, Aye. but something... Um, no, I'm not saying light because I'm not really someone who likes light. So send me your dark. Something with a thematic weight, but not so many grisly murders. Yes, thank you for articulating that for me. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Oh, awesome. Well, dark and just... disturbing is bleak. Dark and disturbing is is pretty great. So, well, all right, head over to Readsy, sign up. You can send a request to up to five editors at a time. You don't have to pay for anything unless you've come to an agreement. So. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to see who you can uh, work with out there and uh, shape your book into into something that you can take to the next level. Uh, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to David Samuel Levinson. Uh, I know his name isn't down thank here, you but all. add that to it later. Thanks, David. Thank you all at home. Thank you for helping us get to 100,000. Uh, I'll see you for the next one of these. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Martin.